This micro lecture is on forest and field biomass sources. When you have a moment, please visit the NASA website at the shown link. This is a very neat visualization of photosynthesis from space, one of the best we have ever created to date. It really gets you thinking about biomass carbon with a global perspective. Please take a moment and review this week's learning objectives. So what is biomass? Before we get into it, I have to digress a little and start with some amazing biomass. These are pictures of Centurion and Hyperion. Centurion is the tallest eucalyptus tree in the world, making it the tallest angiosperm or flowering plant in the world. The tree is located in southern Tasmania and is 99.6 meters tall. Hyperion is the name of a coast redwood in Northern California that was measured at 115.6 meters tall, which makes it the world's tallest known living tree and tallest gymnosperm. Biomass is very cool. A lot of things are considered biomass, humans included. Bioenergy is predominantly focused on conversions associated with plants and not animals, but there are important animal sources of biomass. The important thing about plant biomass is that all plants have similar chemistry, so a chemistry that works with one type of plant biomass can at least be considered for another type of plant biomass. It also means that when you look out the window, everything green you see has similar chemistry, and this includes all wood items we use daily. Here is the map of agricultural productivity again. The real question is can the areas with high productivity use that strength? Can they use that strength to support the demand of the areas that are utilizing the most energy? Pictures of the earth at night are a very good way to get a feeling for where most of our energy consumption is occurring. It is very interesting that the areas of energy consumption overlap so well with the areas of intense agricultural productivity. For the purpose of this class, biomass will be divided up into five main types. Forest biomass, agricultural biomass, aquatic biomass, landfill waste, and wastewater sludge, or biosolids. I would like you to consider categorizing the five main sources of biomass into two categories. The first is rural distributed sources like forests and fields. These sources of biomass are generally found in country settings and they are often enormous but spread out, requiring harvest and consolidation. The second category is urban consolidated sources like landfill waste and wastewater sludge. Aquatic biomass is included because algae have considerable potential for becoming this kind of a biomass source. These sources of biomass are generally found in more urban and suburban settings, and they have already been consolidated by us to keep our cities and towns clean. So what is forest biomass? It is primarily logging residues, mill waste, and roundwood. The tough thing about forest biomass is that there is a lot of forest and it is tempting to believe that should mean it's easy to use for bioenergy. The problem is that there has been a strong market for wood for hundreds of years, so the wood that can be economically removed from the forest is removed and it is often used for materials. Almost zero wood is wasted during wood processing, so while there appears to be a lot around, it is not really available or cheap in significant quantities. Another way to look at it is by comparing prices. Gasoline goes for about 65 cents a pound, and most lumber is sold for about 40 cents a pound. So if wood could be easily turned into gasoline, then maybe it would be more economic to turn wood into gasoline than to turn it into lumber. Unfortunately, it is not easy to turn biomass into gasoline, and it's very easy to turn into materials. So it is likely that a lot of forest biomass will continue to be used for primarily lumber unless it is a special case like wood pellets. Logging residues are a very common source of forest biomass. They are what is left over after the tree has been cut and loaded onto a truck. 
Logging slash is the branches, roots, and unwanted stem sections of the tree, along with some brush depending on the area. Slash is very cheap and can be stored in piles outside without degrading, but it is also very wet, full of rocks and dirt, and spread out in lots of little piles all over the forest. Conventional practice tells us that the forest products companies would probably be using it right now for fuel if it was economic to recover for that use. The fact that they aren't suggests a challenge in leveraging this resource. The production of lumber from logs generates a lot of sawdust, shavings, and chips. Much of the media suggests that mill waste is actually waste that could be used for biofuels, but unfortunately this is not true. The wood processing facilities of today have almost no waste. Many mill residues are sold for use in wood composites and for landscaping or habitat restoration. What isn't sold at a good margin for other products is utilized by the mill for energy to produce the steam needed for drying. Mill residues are a great source of biomass for bioenergy when they can be found cheaply and with good availability. But this is not common. Growing trees on tree farms and harvesting trees from natural forests is expensive and generally whole trees do not make a great deal of sense economically for biofuels. However, some tree farms grow trees so fast that harvesting them for bioenergy does make sense. This source of biomass may face stiff competition for the trees from biomaterials companies in the future. But at the moment, there are some interesting developments. If you can find a cheap, large, consistent supply of logs, there is a lot you can do with them from a bioenergy perspective. So where is the forest biomass in North America? Primarily in the Pacific Northwest and the South, but also in Minnesota, Michigan, New Hampshire, and Maine. Now we're going to discuss agricultural biomass. There are four major categories of agricultural biomass. Grasses, small trees, agricultural residues, and grains. Pretty much any biomass that can be grown in a field is considered agricultural. This is its own category of biomass because it is often quite mechanically and chemically different than forest biomass, and it is produced from man-made ecosystems using water and arable land. Biomass, meaning trees, grass, etc., is made primarily of carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen. In an agricultural setting, biomass gets its carbon from the CO2 in the air, it gets the hydrogen from water, and it gets most of the nitrogen from fertilizer. That means to make biomass grow fast, it must have a large supply of water and fertilizer. Otherwise, it doesn't have the raw ingredients to grow as fast as we want. This is where the food versus fuel argument stops making sense. Since energy crops generally require intensive agricultural practices, they obviously compete with food crops. However, the food versus fuel argument has always been political and silly, because we raise plenty of non-food crops like cotton, flax, tobacco, lavender, and peppermint. There is no such thing as fuel versus food because we are not running out of food and we have massive amounts of arable land. Water is a contentious issue, but the price of food will change with or without energy crops. The chicken, beef, and pork lobbies are largely behind the vast majority of food versus fuel debates. High yield grasses are an energy crop. These sources of biomass are some of the fastest growing sources we have available. Grown in a warm place with lots of water and some fertilizer, they will outproduce the jungles of South America in biomass production. They also have much less lignin than trees, so they are much more digestible. This is why cows can eat grass but not wood. While they grow incredibly fast, they are tough to store, seasonal, and have some challenges around conversion. However, it is very likely that energy crops like this will play a big role in the future of bioenergy. The small trees that are considered energy crops 
are poplar, willow, and eucalyptus. They all have the same strengths as forest biomass, but less of the weaknesses. They are a cleaner, cheaper source of wood, and because they are higher density, they have better transportation economics than grasses. They also have the potential to be used for other markets if the bioenergy markets are not strong for some reason. However, you have to keep in mind that they do have a slower growth rate. Agricultural residues are a very exciting potential source of biomass because with a few exceptions they aren't really used for any high dollar products right now. There are a lot of agricultural residues available and they have many of the same challenges as the grasses and crops they are produced from, but they are also cheaper and have already been consolidated. Agricultural residue conversion shows promise of being one of the best sources of biomass for bioenergy conversions. While it is not the mainstream topic, it wouldn't be fair to not include grains in the discussion of agricultural biomass. Currently, the largest source of biomass for biofuel is grain, in the form of corn, for the production of ethanol. Grains do not get anywhere near the yield per acre that grasses get, but as a source of sugars and oil, they require very little processing compared to grasses, so there is a trade-off. Despite the constant discussions about yield, there are other considerations, and it is important to think about the objectives in deciding what the appropriate biomass is. So where is our agricultural biomass? Primarily in the Midwest. Everyone has some, but the Midwest has an awful lot. When you think about land-based biomass, I would like you to consider the following. It generally sells for about $60 to $70 a ton, except grains, which are far more expensive. It is the most conventional source of biomass. In order to use it, it must be collected and transported to a central location because it is a very spread out resource. It can be expensive to process into the correct shape, like lumber and wood chips. And because it is solid, it is difficult to feed into a chemical reactor. This is a challenge that the pulp and paper industry faces. Biomass, like coal, is a solid, and it is very challenging to turn into a liquid or a gas to be used for chemicals and fuels. As a fun fact, did you know that California used to be a major seaweed producer? Kelp harvesting is big business and ships like this used to roam the California coast collecting it for processing. When you have a moment, please visit the San Diego News website at the shown link to read more about kelp harvesting in California.